Welcome to Mission Oriented, a veteran crowd podcast that showcases veteran talent from both the private and public sectors. Their impact is everywhere. We are here to uncover it. Here's your host, Bob Lowden. Welcome, everyone. This is your host, Bob Lowden. Thanks for joining the Mission Oriented Podcast on the Veteran Crowd Network. My guest today is a candidate for Senate in the state of Nebraska, John Glenn Weaver. Welcome to the program. Thank you for being with us today. My pleasure, Bob. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, before we get into the discussion of politics, and and, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to, uh, you know, ask, ask smart questions about politics. But before we do that, uh, tell us a little bit. You spent uh, spent a career in the Air Force. Uh, tell us about how that happened. I mean, when did when did you decide to go into the Air Force? How did that all start? That's a great question. Uh, grew up on a farm and a, a very close friend of ours was enlisted in the Air Force. And the Air Force is really the only branch I ever knew. And um, I knew I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself, fly airplanes and um, looked for a college that had um, Russian language, ag, and ROTC, and uh, chose the University of Wyoming in Laramie. So I probably knew I wanted to be in the Air Force uh, w- while I was homeschooled in the eighth or ninth grade. Russian language? Yeah, I speak, I speak Russian, and I have a degree in, I think it's Russian linguistics. But now, was that something that you had before, or it, it, what was what was the driving interest in Russian to so begin with? In, you're in one of the first people I've ever met that, that, that had <laughs> the that. summer of my the summer of my junior year uh, in high school. I was being homeschooled. I, I did a foreign exchange program to Moscow State University in Moscow, and then up to Saint Petersburg. And so I really enjoyed the language. Went to Cornell, did a summer program there, and then thought, well, hey, I kind of like the language stuff. I studied ag because I grew up on a farm, and figured I got both things covered. If I need a job somewhere, I just I just do and go after what I love. We're going to we're going to come back to that Russian connection. I bet that's got something to do with what you're doing now. But um, so you go into the Air Force, become a pilot, fly the KC-135. Is that what you the RC, the R- um, RC-135? Yeah, the RC-135 up behind me here. It is a it is the KC-135 uh, airframe that's kind of retrofitted with a lot of antennas and whatnot. Uh, for collecting uh, ISR, got it. Intel okay. surveillance and reconnaissance, and you've been you've been all over the the world as a result of that, including uh, some time in the Middle East. Yes, uh, all of, well, all over the Middle East, uh, flew combat missions over Iraq and over Afghanistan. I was uh, flying over Iraq during the shock and awe in 2003, uh, after we went from Southern Watch and Northern Watch to taking the country. Uh, and then I also was in Afghanistan on the ground and in the air, uh, several hundred hours of combat sorties on the RC-135 in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And then I did sensitive reconnaissance ops out of Greece and then Japan. It, it, interesting career, uh, military-wise. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you have decided to get into politics. You you've uh, you threw your hat in the ring. Uh, I want to say a year or so ago, and and uh, seeking a seat in Congress. But now you're running uh, uh, in a, I guess, a Republican uh, primary to uh, uh, to represent the state of Nebraska. That yeah, that's correct. So um, a lot a lot of events have happened here. Uh, senator Sass, who was our uh, junior senator from Nebraska, resigned and then took a job at the University of Florida as the president. And then uh, the governor, Governor Pillen, Jim Pillen, interviewed. I think a few of us. I was one of the guys that interviewed. I think he had a hundred and something applications for the job to fill to the next general election. So I had a good conversation with Governor Pillen. Uh, ultimately, obviously, was not selected. Uh, so I'm running for the open seat in 2024. It's the class two seat. It's the junior senator from Nebraska uh, to fill the remaining two years of uh, Senator Sass's term in 2024 to 2026. And then you got to run again in 2026 for this full six year term. Now, there's a, you know, now, Nebraska has sort of the Republican trifecta in the sense that the governor and both senators currently serving are Republicans. That's correct, but it hasn't always been that that way. You know, we had Bob Kerry, which is a medal of who was a Medal of Honor winner. He was our senator uh, for a little while. We had Ben Nelson back in the '90s, but for the last 
15, 20 years, we've had a Republican governor and a Republican, two Republican senators. So the, the, the primary becomes a very important election in the state of uh, Nebraska. Well, the, the primary, it's never over till it's over. Uh, but the primary usually in Nebraska, the Republican primary is usually decides who, who, uh, who's going to get the slot. Yes. Now, who who is sitting in the in that slot now um, that uh, was I guess was appointed by the right. state? So, the, so the governor appointed uh, Pete Ricketts. Uh, family is worth several billion dollars, and they own TD Ameritrade. He was the governor for eight years, uh, so he was appointed uh, into that slot, and he um, and so he's currently serving as an appointed senator, not elected in that position until twenty till next year. Uh, I hate to admit my ignorance on this, but would he be running in the primary as well to continue in that seat? So you would be challenging him. He for has that opportunity. Yes, he has. And then there's also another guy, uh, Charles Herbster, who ran uh, in the governor's race, who was unsuccessful, that was backed by President Trump. That's also contemplating on winning, whether or not to get in. But for, for right now, it's it's me and uh, Pete Ritz. Okay. And so this, this primary election will take place sometime a year from now. Well, it's May, uh, May of 2024. Okay. May of 2024. All right. So let's, let's get into the, let's get into the issues. Um, you know, you've been in the military, served a career in, in the air force, retired recently a year or so ago. And, um, and, and decided to get into politics, uh, what I've, I've had people say sometimes I ought to get into politics, but I've, I've, you know, I've never really pursued it. So what, what's, what sort of the thought process have you been going through? That's a, that's a life? great, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not regretting my decision, but no. So August of last year or the year before uh, 2021, the pullout of Afghanistan, I was on active duty and I saw what happened there. And incidentally, the last man to die in Afghanistan is from Nebraska. And the way we pulled out of that, pulled out of that theater, you know, I had, I had spent 20 years of my life. So I came in in 1999, you know, obviously the war kicked off in 2001 and I served until the end. I, I wasn't, I came in and out of the theater several times. So it's something I invested my life and my twenties and my youth in over there as, as did many other people. I was fortunate to come back with, with all my limbs and faculties and everything else uh, which unfortunately others did not. So I thought to myself, if, if I don't step up and serve in this other capacity after serving 22 years in the Air Force, I really thought that was my calling to provide uh, national military sort of leadership uh, in the Senate or in the House somewhere or another to, uh, to better serve my country because I thought I can do so many more things in the Senate than I can in the House. And it was really that the tragic, haphazard, irresponsible pullout of Afghanistan, that 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 was the sort of the uh, the first shot of of the battle, I guess I would say. Got it. So, um, you know, Congress used to be uh, heavily weighted uh, with veteran um, uh, membership. You know, I, I want to say after World War II, upwards of seventy percent of the members of Congress had had experience in the military. That number has dropped off precipitously, although I do think in recent years we've seen more and more people. You and I talked about Eli Crane, who's been a guest on the program. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's a freshman congressman from the state of Arizona at this point. Uh, you know, some other uh, friends and colleagues of mine now serving in Congress. What, what do you think it is uh, about having veterans in Congress that helps? And what do you think it is about the non-veteran population of Congress that hurts? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and incidentally, there's 17 percent of of folks in Congress are veterans. That doesn't even talk about retirees. There's even few le fewer retirees. So kudos for the freshman class and Eli and a couple other folks uh, that are serving there. But but as veterans, we don't want to be right. We just want to be right. We don't care about who gets the credit. We just want to do what's right for the country. We want to serve the country. And I think uh, as a veteran, you bring a perspective of service and you and you want to do what's right for the nation. And when conflicts arise like Ukraine or Afghanistan, you have perspective having served in war, what a slippery slope we're on in Ukraine and sort of how to walk back from the ledge as far as tanks, airplanes. I mean, next it's going to be people helping in, in, in Ukraine. And I'm, you know, I'm very, very 
cautious about sending more money, planes and resources to Ukraine uh, because I was a veteran. So giving that perspective to my colleagues is, is invaluable. And I could be the lone voice that convinces the other 99 or how many senators are on the roof or on the, on the fence to be able to not enter into a war. So providing that perspective of 20 years in combat, serving my country for 22, uh, you have to have that voice, I think, in the room when you're going to commit the sons and daughters of the great state of Nebraska and the United States to combat who might not come home alive. So, so I see it as my duty to be able to provide my experience in sort of that light. You're listening to the Mission Oriented Podcast on the Veteran Crowd Network. My guest is John Glenn Weaver, a candidate for Senate from the state of Nebraska. Uh, I want to drill down a little bit deeper on uh, uh, some of some of this perspective here about uh, being in the service. I mean, what what skills or qualities or disciplines do you think you gained in the military that I, that, that would translate nicely into being a senator from the state of Nebraska? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, leadership, working with people, um, delegating, uh, understanding analytical analysis. I worked in the Pentagon for six years or three years, worked on the joint staff for the chairman of the joint chiefs for almost six. So before you make a decision, you listen to all the facts, you sort of shut your biases aside, you try to get out of the group think, um, you work with people, uh, you don't have any preconceived notions on anybody else, whether they're Democrat, Republican, how they dress, how they look, where they're from. You kind of come at that with an open slate. I think a lot of veterans, I served with people from all over the United States and all over the world, quite frankly, that became U.S. citizens to serve the country in uniform. And so we bring a level of, of leadership. We listen. Uh, we don't have biases. And we're in this, or at least I'm in this, uh, on a term-limited basis to serve my country in the great state of Nebraska, and also bring up other like leaders and veterans to come back, come behind me, because I don't wanna live in DC for more than two terms. I don't wanna be a career politician. And I'll do things in the process to mentor people. Most military leaders, they've served any amount of time are great mentors. And they mentor people underneath them and they tell them stories about you know their service and how they got the mistakes they made uh, the successes they had. And they're just really transparent and authentic. And after you serve in war for 20 years, serving in the Congress, um, I feel like you got to give something back to the nation. Uh, and you're not there for your own ego or the, or the paycheck or the, 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 the conveniences. You're there to serve and do a job much similar to a deployment. So rolling up our sleeves, getting the work done, working together uh, to solve the problems uh, for America. John, one of the observations that I have is is that the, the the two parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, have have sort of uh, I've got, kind of gone to the extremes. Uh, would be an observation that I have. I think that there is uh, a tendency in Washington for the parties to put pressure on members of the party, uh, you know, to uh, to toe party line things have you have you got any comments on thoughts about that i mean the the general observation may be that it, our government's so polarized uh that not a lot is getting done i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing uh, but uh it it just seems to me that there's there's less cooperation and 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 work in the best interest of the nation today than there was let's say when uh, Ronald Reagan was working with Tip O'Neill back in the 80s, uh, you know, and reaching across the aisle and actually getting things done in the best interest of the country. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it even go not even that far back, even to the early 2000s, you had, uh, you know, Senator Levin working on the Armed Services Committee with John Warner and, and team to get things done. Um, yeah, it's it's a little bit of a you know, it's it's something we're not used to in the military, the the, the partisanship. Uh, you know, and obviously Mitch McConnell, he's he's running the Senate there with his three hundred and fifty million dollar pack, where he selects candidates to get him in there. Uh, he backed uh, the the guy that's in the Senate seat now before Governor Pillen. 
even appointed him as did Lindsey Graham to back back him. So he 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 weighed in there relatively early to make sure that that move was done because he probably wants to know who he can control and who he can't. And with three hundred fifty million dollars, he can do a lot. But ultimately, as we saw in the last midterm election last year, the candidates that he was choosing didn't fare that well. And so, you know, we'd lost the, or we didn't gain the Senate. The Republicans didn't gain the Senate. So I think overall, we've got a candidate quality problem within a lot of congressional leaders uh, and in the Senate. And once we overcome the candidate quality problem, I mean, we'll, we'll run with issues and, and do what's right for America. So I think we have a candidate quality problem. And once you get the right candidates in there, I think a lot of the problems that we see in Washington can be fixed. Um, I, I asked you a question before we got on the air about, uh, you know, there's some movements out there for open primaries and, and rank choice voting. What, what's your opinion on, uh, and, and your stance on, on those types of things as, as a way of, uh, of, of addressing some of this discord and the fractured nature of our politics. Right. So, um, I'm a little, I'm against ranked choice voting just so we saw, see, because how we saw it go down in, in Alaska, you know, that the, if the two Republic, the two Republicans came in second and third, but had more votes total than the Democrat. So, so I, I'm, I'm a little bit, so majority of the people voted for Republican, but in a tie, in a three-way tie, the Democrat got more votes. So the Democrats, the Congress person. So I think I think we should have runoffs. Runoffs are good, like they do in Georgia. I'm not, and I saw a ballot from Alaska, and it was literally twenty or thirty people on there. And so I, I believe in runoffs. The top two people go at it, but I'm not for rank choice voting because uh, it could split the ticket based on the party. As far as open primaries, um, don't know a whole lot about it. I would be against open primaries just because. Uh, I, I'm for more people getting to vote. I'm for for voter ID. I'm for getting rid of mail-in ballots, except for the military, where people come to vote. We have a national holiday where they vote. I'm more concerned on, would be more concerned on that than having an open open primaries that, uh, you know, people can sway elections one way or the other from the other party. Got it. Okay. Um, what are, what are some of the other issues do you think that are central or maybe you know in a theme of what your candidacy candidacy would sure. represent? Sure. Uh, well, major issue with major issues with Nebraska. Number one is agriculture. Agriculture is our biggest industry. Uh, first time in a hundred years we've actually have a farmer as our governor. So to, that's that's another another <laughs> crisis. But uh, so having grown up on a farm, studied animal science. Uh, was homeschooled on a farm. I understand ag. I don't understand it as well as some of the big farmers do now, but but ag is a priority in, in Nebraska. Exporting uh, our crops in Nebraska is something we need to work on. Uh, Western Nebraska population, there's sort of a drain brain drain there. So we need to bring ag schools, ag tech schools to Western Nebraska to get uh, to keep our young folks in farming uh, and to make it lucrative from them. And stop the Chinese from buying farmland and let younger Nebraskans take over the farm. So ag ag exports is a huge. I've traveled all over the world to all the continents, and you can't get a better steak than you can around the world than you can in Omaha, Nebraska. And so we need to bring that bring that level of uh, excellence as the beef state producing the most beef to around the world and export our products. Secondly, the another next biggest thing I believe. Uh, is national security. So in Nebraska, we have the United States Strategic Command, which is in Omaha, which is the sort of the, the nuclear master gunner, if you will, that runs all the nuclear weapons. And we also have in Western Nebraska, an ICBM intercontinental ballistic missile field uh, that's out there that the Air Force maintains. So that's part of their community too, as well as an, a large National Guard base in Lincoln. So I'm the only candidate for now that's that that's running for this seat that has any national security experience. And I think when you have the base that runs all the nuclear weapons, the base that has nuclear weapons in the state that could be launched by the president of the United States at any time, when you have balloons flying over and the Chinese collecting intelligence, I worked in the intelligence community in Washington, DC for three years. I worked in the NSA, CIA, DIA for an extensive amount of time. I know how foreign nations collect. I know how we collect. And so to be able to bring that expertise to Nebraska and expand the base 
uh, expand the mission set and and bring people to enjoy the good life of Nebraska. So those would probably be ag, ag, and uh, national defense is kind of where I, and I'm the only candidate with ag experience too. I mm-hmm. mean, I've got the malignant melanoma uh, from driving a tractor because we couldn't afford a cab or air conditioning. So um, I probably wouldn't go throwing hay bales around today, you know, based on my back and everything, but, but I have driven a tractor. I've ran a farm and I've served in the military, two things that Nebraska needs and their U S Senator to be able to advocate. And I'll bring credibility when I'm in the armed services or when I'm in the Senate, when I'm talking to my colleagues, if you've served your nation in combat in 22 years, I'm not saying they're all going to bow down to me, but I come with a lot more credibility than somebody who didn't serve in the military. That's trying to fight for defense budgets. All right. You know, uh, they call Washington DC, the swamp for a reason. One of the, uh, one of the problems I think is we have so much concentrated in Washington, DC. It makes no sense to me, for instance, why the department of agriculture isn't in a place like Nebraska, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 it, it, anyway, that's just kind of a, a sideline comment, but uh, you know, Washington, DC has so much concentrated in it, but I think they're insulated from the rest of the country and don't realize what's going on in places like Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, well, and, and the problem is, is we don't we we've got career politicians serving in in Congress that have been there for, you know, uh, Chuck Grassley's one state over in Iowa. I think he's been there. I was talking to him for forty five years. So, and he can come back and forth, but at some point in time, you lose touch with the common man if you are always in Washington D.C. and you get focused on what the lobbyists think. And so, you need that transfer of transfer of. Um, power the transfer of talent to come in and out to add new and fresh ideas because nobody ever has no one person has all the great ideas yeah i mean if you could change one thing about the way congress works what would that be i'd probably say term limits term limits okay yeah. and what's and what's your reasoning behind that well to- because because people will know that they're there for a limited amount of time and they'll work hard to do what's right for the time that they're there and they're not thinking well, if I do this and in 10 years, I can be, I can be in leadership and nobody's going to be able to amass $350 million in a pack and pick who they want. So there's such high turnover rates. Well, it wouldn't be high turnover, but higher than it is now. I think it would, it would force people. It would encourage people to get things done while they're there because they know the time is short. John, you got about a year in front of you before the, uh, uh, the the primaries conducted. So, what does that track look like for you? What are you What are you out doing right now? What does uh, What does the road ahead look like for you? Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, ninety three counties in Nebraska, and it's uh, some of the counties are not very populated. Arthur County, I think, has six hundred people. Douglas County, a couple hundred thousand. Uh, so, my goal is speaking to the people and letting the people know my message and why I'm serving. And so, I've been traveling the state. Uh, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, and in between Scotts Bluff is further west. I've traveled. Uh, I've, I'm a pilot, so I've flown around a little bit too. But just traveling the state, talking to people about how I want to serve them and serve Nebraska in the United States Senate. Uh, that that has been my people. Just... And 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 how do people follow your campaign and get in touch with you and and uh, communicate with you? Right. Excellent. Uh, so I have a website. Uh, weaver for senate.com and then i'm also on um, instagram facebook uh, twitter uh, true social rumble at uh, jg weaver ne as in nebraska so weaver for senate.com i've got a nice website built there if somebody wants to follow along uh, get email updates as to what i'm doing and the press releases i'm pushing out that's kind of the main hub there and then as as the the election or as the election gets closer I'll probably come out with some mailers and some videos and things to to reach a look, few more people and all the while fundraising through the process. But but my main focus is a grassroots, get out, meet the people, let them know what I'm about and why I want to serve them in the U.S. Senate. We will make uh, make available links to all of the ways that you can get in touch with, with uh, John on the landing page on our website. Uh... Uh, show notes here for the for the program uh you know john uh any final comments as we wrap up here uh that you'd like to leave with our listeners no just uh thank you i'd appreciate anybody's support and um you know with what's going on in the world with taiwan ukraine 
with Iran, Israel, North Korea. Uh, I'm really concerned for our country and our number one, our number one responsibility as a, the Senator or President in the elected capacity is the safety of America. I've been keeping Americans safe for 22 years. I've had skin in the game. And if people are concerned, if their kids are going to go die in a war, that's not in the best interest of America, I will not let that happen. Uh, I, I, I'm not an anti-war person, but we only go to war when it's an existential threat uh, to the United States. I just think politicians that haven't served in war might be a little bit um, too, and might be just a little bit too eager to get us into a war, not intentionally, but it's like a slow boil. It never happens like, okay, we're going to send a brigade across. It's tanks, airplanes, advise and assist, just like Vietnam started in the late 50s. So, um, and I'm serving with my heart on a term limited basis, Weaver for Senate.com. And, uh, and my phone number's on there, reach out. I'd love to talk to anybody, but thank you so much for having me, Bob. And thanks for all you do for veterans. Thank you. It's been great to have you on the program again, John Glenn Weaver running for Senate in the state of Nebraska, sir. Thank you so much for your service to this country. Good luck with your campaign. Good luck with the primary. I'll throw out a Bravo Zulu to you from a, from a one army guy to an air force guy. And that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to mission oriented. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and you won't miss an episode to learn more about mission oriented and the veteran crowd network visit us at www.veterancrowdnetwork.com.